My name's Chanel Johnson. I'm the first full-time Black and Minorities Ethnic Students Officer. I'm proud to present our Black History Lecture Series. Andrew Mohammed discusses African civilizations. Greetings, my name is Andrew Mohammed, aka The Investigator. And what I do, I go to schools, colleges, universities, and we like to motivate young people and teach them about the beautiful civilizations around the world. Today's theme is African civilizations across the world because I personally believe that Africa is our throne, but the earth was the home. And we're going to take a fly visit, first stop to ancient Egypt. I call Egypt the X-Men, because every time you saw the pharaohs in ancient Egypt, they were standing what's called the Osiris or the Asaur position of the X. And um, when you go there, it came it, the proper name for Egypt, Kemet, the land of the blacks, known as the two lands. You had Upper Kemet and Lower Kemet. And the pharaohs in Upper Kemet wore the white crown, and the pharaohs of Lower Kemet wore the red crown. Now, the Nubians, or the Africans of Kemet, Egypt, they mainly presided in Upper Kemet, Upper Egypt, okay? Um, and so, therefore, you could actually see by the crown that they wore that they were of, of African heritage, of the Nubian heritage. And when you go to the very first depiction of the oldest pharaoh, the first dynasty, his name was Nama, and you see him very clearly on what's called the Nama tablet. He was a king or pharaoh that came from Upper Kemet. He came from Upper Kemet. How could we tell? Because if you look at the crown that he was wearing on the Nama tablet, he wore the Upper Kemet crown, which showed that he was of African heritage. He was going into war at this time, and this tablet shows him going into war, and he's holding the head or the hair from the head of one of the people from Lower Kemet, and he's about to hit him in his head or strike him in his head with the royal scepter. That royal scepter became the symbol of power and unity. All this depiction came from royal Nama, King Nama. Um, on the Nama tablet also, you see a bird. Some people say it's an eagle, some say a falcon or a hawk, looking down at Nama. That bird represented an attribute of the Creator. And it was known as Horus, or the African name, Heru. And he's looking down on King Nama as if to bless Nama that the work that you are doing, unifying the Upper Kemet and Lower Kemet, I'm blessing you on. In the two corners of the Nama tablet, you find um, depictions of two bulls. Yeah, And the bull, from ancient times, was the symbol of power and strength. And the eagle that you see on the Nama tablet, what country has taken that as their symbol for their leader? Of course, you're looking at America, okay? Every time you see the seal of America, you see the eagle sitting there. That came directly from uh, ancient Egypt or Kemet, the lands of Northeast Africa. And when you see a close up of King Nama, you will see, without a doubt, his strong African features. The Greeks called him Mens or Menes, but at the same time, in history books, don't be misconfused, don't be, don't be confused that this is dealing with an African king, a Nubian king that established the first dynasty, and then there was another 29 approximately after that. Nama was so powerful, so world renowned, that many thousand years later, we have a film called Scorpion King. Believe it or not, Scorpion King in Hollywood was talking about King Nama, the African king of, of ancient Egypt. And why was he called the Scorpion King? Because the Scorpion King, when you look at a scorpion, it's built like a battle tank. It's like built like a tank. It's rigid. It was strong. And when you feel the sting of a scorpion in its tower, it was like being hit by Nama in battle. Nama was hence the Scorpion King. And the whole film that we see today was in homage of King Nama. And what I like to say as well, for those of you who can travel and go to Egypt, and if you can't go to Egypt, get the books. But when you go to Egypt's Cairo Museum, on the second floor, you see what Nama's army looked like. It didn't look like what you see today in the Hollywood films. They were a strong African bloodline. This is what this army, in equivalent terms, was like the superpower of today. And you see pictures of them in the Cairo Museum. I'd like to jump 
quickly now to what I call the third dynasty. And I don't really want to talk about a pharaoh right now, but I want to talk about someone who wasn't a pharaoh, but he became much more famous than the pharaoh of his time. And I'm talking about a man called Imhotep. And Imhotep, when you say Imhotep today to many of the young boys and girls in school, they immediately laugh because they think of the mummy returns, that Imhotep was a mummy. No, no, no. Historically, Imhotep was one of the world's first great multi-geniuses. The very word Imhotep, the very word Imhotep means he who comes in peace. And that's what Imhotep was. He was a man of great peace, but he was a phenomenal multi-genius. Amongst many things, Imhotep was one of the world's greatest scientists, priests, doctors, doctor, philosopher, poet, farmer, astronomer, chemist, mason, and he was a brilliant architect. In fact, one of the greatest buildings that he designed was called the Step Pyramid, which, according to many scholars, was the first pyramid on Earth. It stands 5,000 years after Imhotep lived in an area called Saqqara, which is just outside Cairo. And when you see the Step Pyramid, you're looking at a work of a genius for about four or five thousand years, even after Imhotep. And if you look closely, and I'm a film man, when you go and to the cinemas and you look at films, look at the logo of Columbia Studio. Very, 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 very wise. Because what they see here is a lady standing with a illuminated lamp. And as she's standing on that lamp, what she is actually standing on is the six steps of Imhotep's pyramid. Yeah? From the word step, every step you went on, you knew more. And from that building, you get the term knowledge, alleged that you knew more. Imhotep was a great scientist, a great doctor, a great chemist. And in fact, we're moving away from ancient Egypt because there's so much more we can say about ancient Egypt and the kingdoms of the Nubians. But I would like to move across to West Africa and I want to talk about a land that today, Many people have literally just walked by and discouraged. But in ancient times, that land was literally, again, another superpower of West Africa, and that is the land of Mali. And the king I'm talking about is the king called Mansa Musa. His kingdom of Mali, with the river Niger going right away through it, which gave it its, its main wealth, was the size of the whole of Europe put together. And the time that we're talking about, the 1300s, let me put into context what was taking place around the world. Europe was decimated with the Black Plague, or the, 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 the Great Plague, or the Black Death of, of, of the medieval period. So Europe was decimated. It was virtually a place not even to be spoken about in many realms. The Islamic Empire was being decimated by um, Genghis Khan. So the Muslims at that time was losing a lot of their powers. But in 1324, an African king stepped onto the horizon and he stepped onto the sands of the deserts. And as he walked to complete his pilgrimage known as Hajj, he walked with 60,000 brothers with him. And in that 60,000 brothers, all carrying gold. And then he had 500 servants carrying sceptres of gold. This man was a walking El Dorado. And he walked on his way to Mecca. He stopped off in Cairo. Cairo at that time was known as the gold. The, 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 the standard of gold was placed in Cairo. It was the golden exchange capital. But yet when this man moved into Cairo, he gave out so much golden gifts, free gifts to the inhabitants of Cairo that he caused the stock exchange or the value of gold to go plummeting down and became worthless because he gave out so much gold. And he affected the gold standard of Cairo for over 10 years. Can you imagine how much gold you've got to give out to affect an economy for 10 years? That was the King Mansa Musa. And when this Europeans start to map out their charts of the lands of the world when it came to Africa. In the center of Africa, what did they do? They showed Mansa Musa sitting in the center of Africa on a golden throne. 
with golden hat, with a golden nugget and a golden scepter. They were showing the wealth of Mansa Musa. And let me make it plain, Mansa Musa's Mali wasn't the only African kingdom that had this kind of power. You could move right down into the kingdom of Zimbabwe, yeah? And the great stone buildings and the great stone, stone walls of Zimbabwe, they showed they had a great empire. We could also talk about the great empire of um, Songhai and Timbuktu, which came later in, in, in West Africa, but also we can go to Nigeria. And we talk about the Benai bronze men, which the Nigerians had skills of metalwork that literally could match any at that time of Spain, Portugal, and Italy. So Africa had many, many empires that we could be speaking about today. Also, we'll have to move away from the motherland of Africa now and go to India. Yes, India. India in its root, and it's in its first inhabitants, the civilization of India, were what term I'll call African or black in color. In fact, the word India comes from the word Indus, which is the river that ran through what we call India today, and that Indus civilization, according to many scholars like J.A. Rogers and what have you, okay, they stated that the word Indus literally means black. Literally means black. So India, is again the land of the blacks. And when you go to the Indus civilization and you go to the root of it, you find what's called the Harappan civilization, which is present day Pakistan. And that Harappan civilization was a math was a was a civilization of mathematical genius. But they found that in this Indus civilization, we're talking about four to five thousand years ago, you're talking about again a stone civilization. You're talking about stone buildings, three to four story buildings high. Pure technology. We're talking about restaurants. We're talking about shops. We're talking about um, seaports. We're talking about underwater drainage. We're talking about a great civilization of mathematical genius. And guess what? Disappeared overnight. Disappeared overnight. But India, in its root, you have to look to the Harappan civilization. And in fact, they've got many terracotta images of what these Harappan people look like, and you see without a doubt, they were strong African uh, features. Also, you have a very famous one known as Akimbo, which is known as the Dancing Girl, and all scholars agree that this Dancing Girl was of 100% black African parentage. Today, you have a civilization in India called the Bonda tribe. The Bonda tribe, these are the closest direct descendants of the Harappan civilization. Today, there's only eight hundred of them left and um, you see very clearly they look African and many of their traditions are still linked to Mother Africa today. Also you have from descendants of the Bonda people you have what's called the Daleks and the Dravidians and the Tamils. These are all offsprings of that great Harappan civilization and sometimes when you look at some of the, the old sadhus, some of the old priests of India you see that many of them in ancient times and even in today have the locks of the Rastafarians and they sit in the lotus position contemplating and meditating on the great wisdoms of the universe and so from there I'd like to shoot across to America and especially Middle America, Middle America and Southern America because again you'll find many of their vases and many of their potteries, many of their artifacts you'll see uh, an existence of African or what they call black Indian civilization in the root of American civilization. You see many of their temples where you see the red man and the black man living as one, conversing as one, wearing leopard skin um, outfits and costumes. This is right across many of the temples and many of the walls of ancient um, America. In America as well, especially in Mexico, you'll find pyramids pyramids that can equate to any of the pyramids that we find in Sudan and in ancient Egypt. Why? Because they were built by the same people. Yeah. Uh, at the root of that civilization in Mexico, you'd have to go to a people called the Olmec civilization. The Olmec civilization. This civilization wasn't even discovered until the late 1930s and they discovered it by accident. How? 
He was doing exca excavation work on a small island called Leventa, and they came across a massive stone head. Some of these heads that they found deep in the jungles of the islands of Mexico and in the islands, um, sorry, in the jungles of Southern America, these heads, some of them weighed over four to five tons. And when you find these heads, you find that they had massive thick lips, the broad African nose, the high cheekbones, and the round head of these Africans. I mean, when you see these heads for yourself, you see it would be a fool to argue against the case that this was an ancient civilization that flourished and this civilization was of African parentage. Even the Aztecs that we speak about today, they give homage to what they call the Black Fathers or the Black Gods of ancient um, Middle and Southern America. And when you look at some of the priests in the terracottas of um, Mexico, they look very similar to the, 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 the Buddhas that they found in Africa, the Buddhas that they found in Southern Asia, and yes, the Buddhas that they found in China. I would like to move off to China right now. China, in its essence, again, was of African heritage. This is not me making it up. The first two dynasties of ancient China um, is the Xing and the Shang dynasty. And those two dynasties, when you go back and look at some of the oldest pottery, some of the oldest images, they will see, without any shadow of doubt, the very core of African civilization. And among the Xing and the Shang dynasty, they laid the foundation of what we call Chinese art and culture. It was the Xing and the Shang dynasties of the Africans of ancient China that gave us the science of, of um, raising millet, of horticulture of the rice, of, of, uh, of the rearing of the silkworm and making the best silk. It was these people that gave us the science of calligraphy. It was these people that literally gave us all the things that we talk about Chinese civilization was rooted in the first two dynasties of ancient um, China, which again was the essence of the Africans. And in 1930, the, um, the Department of Agriculture in America, they were doing some investigations into the southern jungles of China. They came across an Aborigine tribe. J. Roger showed in his book. They came across an Aborigine tribe of Chinese Africans that lived amongst themselves and had their own ways and their own traditions, their own morals and their own spirituality, living in the jungles of China still today, of absolute African youth. Okay, and there's images of these findings all over. Also, we think about China, we think about martial arts, and therefore we have to go to the Shaolin Temple. And when you go to the Shaolin Temple, you see there's a picture of all these monks doing martial arts. Martial arts did not originate in China. There was a visitor that came to China called Bodhidharma. And in their text, they'll say he was Persian or of Indian extract. But when you go to the root of the Persian Empire and to the root of the Indian Empire, which we just spoke about, Bodhidharma was of the same original race. And if you want to take it beyond Bodhidharma, then you can go to the walls of the Ramses III temple in ancient Egypt. And that's not the only temple, but you see the most, some of the oldest depictions of man and woman doing martial arts is found in ancient Kemet, the land of the blacks. This is not me saying it, you can go to the temples today and still see those hieroglyphics or those images on the temples um, throughout ancient Kemet, Egypt. And so as we move out of China, as we move out of China, I would like us now just take a little trip to places like Vietnam and Cambodia. Because at one time, that was one kingdom. That was one kingdom, and it was known as the Phnom Kingdom. Okay? And when you go to the Kingdom, which were the predecessors of the people that we see there today, you see that they were of African hue and of African parentage. They made many sculptures of themselves, and again, you see the faces, the, the curly Afro hair, some of them having um, the normal curls, or some of them have what's called China pumps. In fact, when you look at the oldest Buddhas in Southern Asia and in China, you will see that they are 100% of African hue and of African um, outlook. And in fact, they said the most spiritual, most wisest and the most religiously wise um, 
Buddhas, most precious ones, the most ancient ones, had the African curly hair. And we know amongst us in the Caribbean, we have a style called the China bumps, the China bumps. And you see that this is shown all over Southern Asia, okay, amongst the, um, the Vietnamese um, and the Cambodian temples and the mountains of Cambodia. You see that they left a clear mark of their, um, their heritage right across. And if we look at the islands of Southern Asia, whether it be the Polynesian Islands, the Melanesian Islands, the Micronesia Islands, you see today they are of um, the Aborigine stock of African people. Um, moving lastly to Europe, yeah? When you go back into anthropology and you study what they've written there, they say the oldest people of Europe are people called the Grimaldi. G-R-I-M-A-L-D-I, the Grimaldi people. And they again, were black. One of the oldest and the most precious artifacts of the Grimaldi is uh, a sculpture called the Venus of Willendorf. The Venus of Willendorf, okay, in Austria. And when you see her, you find that she's got large buttocks. This is one of the oldest depictions of man. This is about 50,000 years old, this, this image. She's got large buttocks, large breasts, and she's got her hair in tight curls, and it's literally been plaited, like many of our sisters plait their hair today. Um, this was called the Venus of Willendorf, and they said that she was a remnant of what they called the Grimaldi man that lived in Europe, that done many of their paintings in caves and, and artifacts what they actually looked like. And then the Focus magazine, um, a magazine of um, discovery and of science, they've done an article about Britain's first man. And you see there on the front page, you see we look at an Aborigine African. Many, many, many years later, in the 700 AD, you had the people that came into the second wave called the Moors, M-O-O-R-S. The Moors is a corruption of the word black Moors, black as a Moor. And it was these Moors that laid again the foundation of what we call Western civilization or what they call the Renaissance period. The word Renaissance literally means from French to awaken. Who woke up Europe? It was Africans, the Moors, the empire that came in from North Africa and it gave us so much of what we call Western civilization today came via the Moors. They gave us the Arabic numerals. They gave us many um, of the etiquette of manners, good manners. They gave us cross-border relationships. They gave us diplomacy. They gave us the, the, the science of literally parks and universities. They invested wisdom back into Europe, okay? And they, their base was mainly in Spain, Portugal, and Italy. In fact, they were so well regarded that Shakespeare, one of the greatest scholars of that time, he actually done a whole play called um, Othello the Moor. And as you see there, the Moor Othello was of a regal, regal stature. And so the Moors um, was symbolic of being black, black as a Moor. So brothers and sisters, we just touched on some of the various empires or some of the various um, civilizations around the world that had black at its root. My name is Andrew Mohammed. They call me the investigator. Thank you very much.